Sounds good. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Monk, and I um, one of the things I do is design products for a business I have called Monk Makes. And one of the things we do is make accessories for the Raspberry Pi. So um, very quickly, just wanted to show you uh, a couple that we've got. One that's a, a new one, or sort of a new one, and one that um, you just may not be aware of because uh, we haven't made much of a fuss about it. Um, the first one is, uh, I'll show you this no, little no, box. No, no. Yeah. Some of you may even be able to scan the QR code. I don't know. I'll leave it there for a second longer. If you do, it'll um, bring you up uh, a, um, a PDF document, which is basically the instructions for this book. Um, I'll also paste, in, paste into the chat in a moment the, um, the, the link for it. But this is based on a product we had before called the Electronic Starter Kit for Raspberry Pi. And it's pretty much the same hardware, except we've added in, well, we've, we've replaced the light dependent resistor because they contain cadmium and they're sort of frowned a little with a, a photo transistor. And um, I've got a, just a list here somewhere I was just trying to find of the um, products that, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, let's see, go on, excuse me for a moment. Yes, so it's um, got a number of the components to make a number of projects. So there's the usual blinking of LEDs. There's um, an RGB uh, LED that you can then mix to different colors using a nice graphical user interface. Um, thermometer, a thermometer with a buzzer, so that if it gets above a certain temperature, it does something. Um, there's the um, Cheer Lights project, um, much beloved by Simon Walters. I don't know if he's on there. Anyway, there's, that's in there as well, so that when you tweet a particular color, it um, changes the color of the RGB LED. Um, yeah, so that's that's one product. So you get a little bag of components. You get a solderless breadboard and you get um, two sets of jumper wires, one for connecting things together on the breadboard and one for connecting the solderless breadboard to your Raspberry Pi. And you get a little uh, GPIO template that lets you identify the pins when you're wiring up the project. So that's um, one project, one product. The other one is this um, other little kit we've got, which is the speaker for Microbit. Um, sorry, Freudian slip. Speaker for Raspberry Pi. And it's based around this little board. Uh, which I hope you can see that. And then um, it also includes a set of jumper wires um, to connect up the speaker to your Raspberry Pi and a little audio wire to audio lead to connect it up. And um, another GPIO template to identify the pins. Uh, so it takes the only thing it takes from the GPIO pins is the um, power, five volt power. And it's got a little amplifier chip on it and a built-in loudspeaker so that you can, if you just want a quick, easy solution for playing some audio from your Raspberry Pi and you haven't got it connected up to HDMI or whatever, then that's um, it's quite a useful tool for that. And just, uh, yeah, both of those are for sale on CPC. Uh, and as I said, I'll put some links in in a moment. Uh, well, probably while the next speaker's talking, it'd be the easiest thing. The other thing I'd really briefly like to mention is um, just today, I've been uh, messing around with um, the low cost Chinese laser cutter that I've got sat in the garage. It's called a K40. I don't know if anybody's um, got one of them. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised because they're a few hundred pounds and they're, they're quite an interesting device. Um, but I've been using it to um, following the Kitronics design for laser cutting using um, half millimeter plastic, um, a um, uh, basically a, a mask. I'm still waiting on the <laughs> transparent bit. So at the moment it's, um, well, there you go. I mean, it's useful for improving my appearance, but not much else. Um, but the idea, it is very easy to make. Um, and I've put up some, uh, I had to modify the design files um, a little bit because with my K40, I use some software for, called K40 Whisperer, which, which is very popular. It's, it's an open source way of driving the, uh, the, the, the um, laser cutter. Um, and I'm about to finish, but I haven't really given you very much notice. So as I said, I'll paste the links up into the chat session. Thanks very much. That's fantastic, Simon. So um, I haven't seen yet that Jay is here. Um, 
a lot of people. Oh, he, he is. So I think Josh is now going to switch things over. Sam. OK, well, you can see it in front of me. I'm going to talk today about uh, my quiz system that I built um, using uh, the microbit. Um, and uh, basically, I have this problem. I am a primary school teacher and we have a quiz every year um, in my school, four houses, four teams. And uh, I'm stuck at the back as a teacher and they say to me, who put their hand up first? Which house? Which group? I'm going, I don't know. Um, I think it was them. And then they go, no, they didn't get the question right. Who's the second group? And, uh, and I go, oh, I don't know. So I thought, I, I'll, I'll find a system. And I looked online and uh, quiz systems were either huge long wires uh, or they were um, really, really expensive or uh, wireless systems or they were very cheap but they didn't tell you who was first who was second they just played sounds so i thought can i build something with a microbit and use the radio function of microbit to do that and i came across these wonderful cool buttons they're huge um, and they come from cool components they cost about eight pounds um, and uh, inside you'll see that i've got the microbit uh i can actually take this the, the actual um, switch bit out that's just the bit you push down uh, but inside here you've got the actual micro switch there and you've got an led on the top there so it shows you that it's lit up when you press the button but the micro bit there which is doing the controlling um, because this led is 12 volts it requires not just your normal three volt battery pack i don't know if you can see that but it also I, i've added a nine volt battery to it in the circuit to make it up to 12 volts uh, when to control those 12 volts then you need a transistor and you can just see it i've got it on this little bit of breadboard here this little connector there you can see the transistor there um and uh, that i've put a link in the uh, the comments uh, so that they can add it to the notes uh, to my website where i've got all the the wiring diagram for this um, i've actually made it using screws to connect it to the micro bit and crimps because it then didn't involve soldering um, I didn't have to burn my fingers and stuff like that. Um, so that all goes together uh, uh, and makes your, your button. And, and that's that's how you make a button. But the button's only good if um, if it, it sort of works together uh, with some other quiz buttons. So once you've made one, you've got to make another one and another one and a fourth one. I don't think you can see those all at the same time on the camera, can you? and I can't move them back anymore. But I'll give you a flavor of, of how it works um, if, I, if I can. I'm hoping they're all switched on. Yeah, you press the first one and it lights up. You press the second one and I'm going to press that one and it flashes. So you know that one's pressed second. You press the third one and it flashes. Oh, the lights, I'll turn the light off and actually see if that helps. And it flashes just occasionally. And if you press the fourth one, nothing happens at all so the coding that's how the coding is worked so that you can tell exactly who was first second and third and you're thinking well uh, uh, by the way i've got another micro bit here um, and this one has got um, a me sound on the back of it i think it's a kicktronics one and that plays a little buzz as you as you do it as well um, you can also use the micro bit buttons the a button is the button that's actually being worked when you do this but the b button will reset it and there you go. I've reset all the buttons for the next question. Uh, last time, the blue people answered first. Let's uh, the blue team answer first. Let's try the green team. On. No, let's have the red team answer first. We haven't seen their light yet. They answer first. Their button stays on permanently. Uh, the green team answers second. And theirs flashes quite a lot. The blue team answers third. And theirs flashes just occasionally. And the yellow team, they, they press nothing happens so you can tell exactly which order they came in and the final bit was with this soundboard the um the, the way that it um uh, I, I programmed it was i even though the flashes are different depending on which button you press first the sound coming out of the board is going to be the same for each button the, each button each time so the it only sounds for the first one that presses but every time the blue people answer first, it will make the blue team's sounds. Here we go. One sound for the blue team. 
one long low beep and, and i even thought about the sounds what sounds should it make three for the yellow team actually that's that's the, I'll, I'll move that one around a bit that's the third if you like okay oh two for this one it goes up it goes down the three as i said just now it goes up okay and the fourth one is four beeps and they all stay the same so you can tell exactly which team went first I, i'm coming to the end now um that's all of uh, so so josh get ready to put the next person on uh that's a, a brief rundown of, of the project and the idea the design behind it all the details are on the website and of course i think my, my i think that might even give you a link to me you've got my at Weddell, uh, at, uh, at mark from london if you want to tweet to me and ask a question hope that's a good roundup of the whole thing back to you alan right okay um so i'm josh um i have been doing micromag for two years now um when we started so um we're going to do a a quick talk today on like how we create a community magazine um and the different steps that go on behind it uh, because some people see the magazine and think oh you just make a, a 40 page pdf how hard can it possibly be um and we want to try and give people an insight of what we do uh, in our spare time so um i'll start off and then kerry will go a bit more into the history of what we do um but it started off two years ago today um and it was an idea that we had uh just because we wanted to create a community resource for microbit users so i'm pretty sure a lot of people will be familiar with the magpie magazine uh, we kind of stole a similar idea of that uh, and we wanted to create a community magazine that was uh, run by um people who were just passionate about what we do um so i think kerry's gonna tell everyone where we're up to yeah, so when we first started, we had no money or experience in doing this sort of stuff. So we started off um, using Google Slides to make the magazine, which was a bit of a pain in the backside to start with, uh, to get a layout and everything done and software that's meant for presentations. But somehow we managed it. <laughs> to then moving up to, what, issue five was the first one that we ever did in Adobe InDesign. Um, which now, looking at all the front covers, you can actually see it does look a lot more professional than our Google Slides ones. But yeah, um, we think we've came a long, a long way with the, our experience just from going from free software to paid software made our lives a lot easier. Um, yeah, and it was, yeah. it was all about, um, it was a, a lot of learning experiences. So. Uh, like you said before, we we had no experience doing any of this sort of stuff. Like we we made the odd worksheet uh, to put on our own website or blog, uh, but not an actual project that involved putting loads of articles together, editing them. So it has been um, quite the challenge in places, and we've had to learn quite a lot of things. But luckily, uh, we've had a lot of support uh, from the community as well, which is one of the great things about running a community magazine. Uh, so the next bit is uh, how does the process look from having an idea to then getting it in the full magazine? So the first thing is you have an idea. That's basically what it is. So, for example, uh, if someone creates a radio quiz button machine, um, you can... Um, say oh yeah i want to write an article about that so you come up with the idea and it's as simple as that and then the next step is so the next step we then take that idea uh pick, pick a category to put it in whether it's for a news article uh make articles so the make articles are generally things that the participants well the readers of the magazine can go away and make and features tends to be more of things that they want to show us rather than having code and stuff in them and reviews we sometimes get people writing reviews for us but the reviews are generally done by josh and i um so once we then choose a category 
or they can choose a category as well, they then come and put it in a form on our website and tell us about what they've come up with. So Josh has kindly created a very nice contributor's guide for them yeah. to then go through. So um, we kind of tried to streamline the process as we've gone on. So now we have it all automated um, through forms. Obviously, we still do contact people. It's not just talking to a robot all the time. Um, but we've tr we tried to create forms that are easy to use, guides that are easy to follow so that anyone can write an article um, because we don't want that to be a barrier for people writing for the magazine. Because a lot of people that you know write for Micromag haven't had any past experience. And um, so we try and make that as easy as possible. And then basically you come up with the idea, you write it, and then you submit it via another form uh, that basically sends your PDF bio and profile picture to you. Now the next bit I don't get involved in because I don't like it. So I'll let Kerry do that one. So once we get the articles in, they're coming through a Google form, which puts them into our Google Drive. I then pick them up, put them into the folder that they should be in. So whether it's a news article, they'll go in the news folder and basically open it up in Google Docs with Grammarly on and grammar check and spell check them all. Make sure, for instance, a lot of the articles we get come in with microbit with a capital M when it should be lowercase. So just make sure all the casing and everything's correct before we put it in the magazine. Yeah, um, so the next bit is how do we put it together? So Kerry briefly mentioned how we used to do it. Yeah, so when we first started, as I said, we used Google Slides. It is mainly a presentation software, so everything is in landscape when you first start it up. So we then went into page settings, changed it all into sort of portrait mode, uh, made it the A4 size and made a custom template basically ourselves from scratch. That took a few issues to get used to and was a pain in the backside, as I said, trying to put everything in the right text boxes and to do columns as well. They had to be separate text boxes, so it never really worked out properly. So we did have to move to something more professional, especially when we moved into print as well. So Josh then created us a rather nice template again. Yeah. So. Um... We bought a framework off, uh, I forget which website, uh, a website uh, deep in the internet somewhere. Um, and we got a sponsor for Adobe InDesign for three years, um, which is something we get quite a lot, fortunately, like our web hosting is sponsored by a company. Um, our Adobe Creative Cloud license is sponsored by someone because these are really expensive tools. Um, and Adobe InDesign is great, um, we found, because it's really flexible. So it has guides and everything. It's like a proper, well, it is a proper print production piece of software um, because, you know, that's what we needed. But we didn't have the, I don't know, did, wasn't it when we looked earlier, like £60 a month for a Creative Cloud license for what we yeah, needed? Yeah, I think, I think for InDesign alone, it's about £49 a month. Yeah. So it's a lot of money um, and we just simply didn't have that when we started off. Um, and obviously something we do now is print production. So it's really easy to do that, but there's no collaborative working mode. So all of our team is remote and it is a bit of a learning curve to use. So next bit is we don't just do a magazine. We do lots of other things as well. Um, so if I do the bits that I'm mainly part of, so graphic design is something we do a lot. Uh, so we design posters, uh, we design book covers. So that's an upcoming book that we're uh, working on at the minute. And uh, we do lots of graphic design um, all by ourselves. Um, we don't get external people to do that. We do get some stuff done. So like the um, robot of issue six, that front cover was done by a professional. Um, but yeah, there's lots of things that we um, do ourselves. Print production is something we've got into a lot more recently. So uh, this is issue seven, uh, that the proper ones are arriving tomorrow. So we print out um, our magazines and sell those online. Uh, so that's quite cool. Uh, we also um, do posters and stuff like that. Lots of different things that we do. Uh, so print production is quite interesting and we have had a lot of issues with that because uh, like we said at the start, we have no experience with all of that. 
Uh, but hopefully issue seven should be much better because we actually found the proper export setting this time. Um, web design web design was a big task that we took on at the start of this year. Uh, we, redid, we redid our website um, because we had a bit of money to spend on some fancy HTML frameworks and stuff that we could use. Uh, and that looks all nice and fancy now um, because our magazine is fully online. Um, so if Kerry quickly goes through the other three, because I'm conscious that we're going to run out of time. Yep. So the business management stuff that we have to take care of is obviously all the money registering the company online. So we are now a community interest company, which means we can go and apply for funding. Um, then we did decide during this lockdown time to keep ourselves sane that we're going to podcasting. So we now do a micro bit related podcast sort of every two weeks. Uh, the first one got released last Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah. And then, yeah, so then social media. So social media is a big thing for us. That's where we get all our readers and followers. We do no, ever, no other advertisement of such other than through Twitter mainly. We do a little bit of Facebook and obviously a little bit through the podcasting now. But apart from that, yeah, it's mainly Twitter is our platform by the looks of it. Yeah. So uh, if you'd like to write an article, um, if you'd like to take a quick picture of that or watch the recording back later, uh, if you go micromag.cc forward slash contribute, um, there are a few articles that we're looking for. We ran our 2020 annual reader survey that we uh, want to do every year. And these are some of the things that people wanted. So if you want to write an article about any of those things, uh, you can find the list on our Twitter as well, which is on the next page. Uh, and we'd love for you to write an article about anything, uh, but there are some ideas if you're stuck. So if you'd like to follow us, there are the links. You can follow us on Twitter, go on our website. Uh, you can subscribe to us for free or buy a print subscription um, or a print edition, which aren't on sale anymore uh, because we're not going to do any more during the lockdown. Um, you can write an article or you can download for free and the PDF will always be free because that's what we wanted to do from the start. Um, and like he'd said, it is not difficult to do. If you want to write an article, we try and make it as easy as possible. So that yeah, it doesn't it. matter how old or young you are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have um, anyone writing articles, um, any age. So are we going to do questions? We can fire through those quickly. Tom Spencer and I'm from the Birmingham uh, Raspberry Jam and also co-founder of 3D Meetup UK, one of the UK's open source 3D printing um, festivals, which hopefully will go ahead this year. And I think like many people, I use Raspberry Pi to fulfill a need when I have a project or a problem I want to try and solve. And one of the problems I had was my outside security light kept coming on at night and I didn't know what it was. And I never saw what was in the garden. And I never saw what kept triggering it. So I did the, the obvious, got a Raspberry Pi, put a camera on it and tried to make a time-lapse camera and I never caught it. So I used motion eyes, tried to download a bit of motion tracking, and I managed to get some blurs, some blurs of animals running across the garden. And I thought, actually, that's really cool. But I want to know what's really there. So I went into my first attempt at machine learning and some image recognition using um, TensorFlow, and I built my image recognition camera which you see on the front is a Raspberry Pi with an infrared camera. It's not a thermal camera, but an infrared one. And on the back, we've got a little Adafruit TFT display. One of the original ones bought at when the cam came to Raspberry Jams about five years ago. And I left this in a box, left it in the garden. And every time it had some motion, it would take a photo. It would then use machine learning to try and identify what the animal was. So. I want to do a live demo of this, and this is going to be quite intense. So I'm going to VNC onto my Mac. I'm then going to try and share the VNC on the screen. So this is going to be a big moment of truth. And if it works, please, please cheer from wherever you are, because this is the most daring demo I have ever done. So in a second, excellent. So you should be seeing a live preview of my infrared uh, camera. So it's got two little infrared lamps on it and 
these are pretty good for seeing in the dark. They're not thermal cameras. People do get a bit confused as an infrared camera. Currently looking at my my desk. So let's come back. I've set it up so it's all operated from one button. And that one button can trigger the camera taking a picture, exiting the program, and accessing some other menus. So just looking around my desk, I've got uh, my 3D printed homemade microphone. Take a photo. It's captured it. Analyzing, 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 analyzing. It can take anywhere between about 10 seconds and maybe 40 seconds, depending on the picture. I'm hoping to upgrade this to a Pi 4. And we've got a microphone about fifth, fourth down the list. So it did actually correctly recognize that, which was really good. Let's try another one. Um, my my keys. Let's see if we can do the keys. Take a photo. All triggered with the one button on the front. Oops, I managed to miss out a lot of the keys. We'll see what it comes up with. We'll see if it can find it from there. And as I said, I get these animals in the garden every night, running across the garden. Um, projector, modem, digital clock. Mm, not sure about that one. And I had this camera lying in wait in the garden to see if we could see what was out there. Okay, I'm going to go under my desk. Um, I've got socks on. Let's see what can sign down here. So it goes into infrared mode, looking around. Ah, I see something. Ah, who's that? All right, let's take a picture of that one. Capture it. And we'll see if we can analyze that beast in the garden. As I said, it can take anywhere between about five and ten seconds. Hello, Paul. Um, anywhere between about five and ten seconds for it to analyze, maybe up to 40 if it's really struggling. And a lampshade, jellyfish, fur coat, um, a stole, a bonnet. Mm, maybe, maybe not that sure. So this was my, my first foray into uh, machine learning using the ImageNet library. It was a bit of fun. Um, the success rate in daylight is about 75%. The success rate in the dark is about 20%. Um, it comes out with almost everything being jellyfish, but it's, it's kind of it's kind of fun. First go at doing some machine learning. Let's see if we can do my, my glass of um, juice there. Last one, so it gets on. Oh. I think it might spot the MacBook in the back. It might spot the keyboard. It might spot the pint glass. We will see. Um, I have got a write up of it, and I'll, I'll share a link in a little bit. This was this was a lot of fun. This was a quite a good little project just to kind of get you started with TensorFlow, starting to get with a bit of um, image classification. Um, the image classification sort of database is from two, uh, sorry, 2012. So oh, cocktail shaker, desk monitor. It's giving it a good guess. And I noticed it says mouse. I think that might be what it's thinking for the, the GitHub logo. Um, I would love to answer any, answer your questions. If you've got any questions about um, making the project, um, how it was started, sort of how successful it was, um, and maybe come back another time and talk a bit more about TensorFlow, image recognition, and um, uh, convo sorry, neural networks. That'd be quite cool to talk about. So I'm going to. Pass that to Alan, Alan, got any questions or anything to come through? So, okay, so I'm Scott. Um, what I like doing, if you just look behind me there, well, this camera's in reverse, it's a bit weird, but yeah, so behind me is a modular synth that I built myself, and um, that's what I like doing. But also, Raspberry Pis and Arduinos and those kind of microcontrollers are perfect companions to a modular synth, or what I'm going to use, I'm going to use a mini MOOC that I've built as well. But because you can output voltages on a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or stuff like that. And what a, a modular synthesizer wants to see is a control voltage. And usually what they want to see is somewhere between zero and five volts. So brilliant microcontroller territory. So this project came about from me combining my interest with synths, combining my interest with Raspberry Pi. And also you might notice this snazzy headgear that I've got on. So at work a couple of years ago, um, one of the guys at work did a lunchtime session on meditation. Now, I'd never done meditation before, but it was free and I'm an Aberdonian, so I had to go for it. <laughs> so um, I started doing it, started quite enjoying it, find it very relaxing. In fact, at the times we're going through at the moment, it's a perfect thing to be doing. So what this sensor up here does, this measures brainwaves and it's called a, a NeuroSky MindWave. I think you can probably see the logo there. Um, 
And what it does, it can take two readings. Um, it can take attention or meditation. So tonight we're going to try meditation. Now, obviously, webcamming live to 100 odd people um, isn't the best situation for meditation, but we're going to see how we get on. So what we've got, if we can just do a really bad job of camera work here. So down here, there's a little Raspberry Pi down there, and that is connected up to um, the modular synth and via USB to the, um, and here's the synthesizer down here. So this is a mini Moog that I hand built myself, because at the time you can get a mini Moog. And so I managed to build that using circuit board I got from the internet. And then Behringer released one for like 300 quid, which was <laughs> probably far cheaper than I spent on it. Um, don't get me started with Behringer. So if I just turn this up, so you can hear there's a sound coming out there. Now, this is reading meditation. So in a minute, I'm going to close my eyes and try and relax and meditate. And what we should see is if the meditation, if I can get into even a slightly meditative state, um, the pitch will go up. So that's the idea with it. Now you can hear that note, it's like, it's just dinging away. So this is also, this is something else that I built with an Arduino. And there's a little sensor on the ear there. So it's my heartbeat that's controlling the speed of the notes in there. So heartbeat's controlling the speed of the notes, brain waves are controlling the pitch of the notes. So now this, this will be great for webcam. I'm going to shut my eyes and try and relax a little bit and see if I can get the pitch to go up. Okay. I'm not going to go on for too long with just my face or the camera, but hopefully you're getting an idea and you're hearing that and you're seeing what we can kind of do with this. And um, yeah, if there's any questions on that, um, happy to take questions later on about Raspberry Pis or synthesizers or meditation. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. So when you're ready, Gory, you can you can start. So hello, everyone. As you can see. You, you can access the document and read it yourself if you want to. But tonight I can just give you a short review of what Bixby is about. So it's a bit like Google Assistant or Amazon's Alexa. It's an AI conversational engine, but it's for Samsung. It's built by Samsung. It can create events on a calendar or call someone, text someone, and so on. But you can also set up routines. For example, you may set up a routine for driving. If you turn this on, your phone will automatically set messages to be read out loud or a sleep routine that will reduce the brightness and turn to dark mode. But the more exciting thing about Bixby more than Google Assistant, is that you can download the developer's application on your computer and actually write the code to create these setups. Uh, these setups are called Bixby capsules. So they consist of concepts and actions. Concepts are the information which we give Bixby, what we tell Bixby, and actions is when the information is used to do something. If you put it together and experiment with it, you can create your own setups and own routines. I found that really interesting. I've tried some myself, but I wasn't that successful. So you can have a go. In my document, at the bottom, I have pasted a link, which you can click, that will take you to the website where you can download the application and it gives you some head start on how you can build it yourself. 
So you don't actually have to write the program. You teach Bixby how to write it for you, and it writes it. So it's pretty entertaining. Um, yes, that's the link. That's the website. I think that's about it. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask me, and I'll hand over to Alan. Yeah. Gory, that's great. You've you've um, in in your own ways you've helped us make a bit of history because <laughs> you've been coming to our jams for a few months now, and I think that's your first presentation that you've made. So I'm, I'm clapping here, and I think a few other people maybe. And for those who've not met Gory, Gory is a a student of A level computer science at a school in Lancashire, and um, and we've had some conversations. That, Gory's been supporting and helping to run a computer science club in her the school that she attends, and we've had some conversations about that. So I'm I'm really pleased that you you've given your presentation tonight. I'm hoping that we can we can hear some more from you in the future. Now, um, in terms of timing wise, we're 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 if we were sticking to our schedule, we're doing really well. Um, okay, so I thought um, this morning I'd talk to you about my latest project. Um, well, when I say latest project, actually it's been going on for about three years, uh, but it had a bit of a hiatus and I've not done much with it for a while. Um, I made a robot about um, two or three years ago. You can see um, it's standing there behind me. Um, and it was originally constructed from um, a couple of these, which are um, Meccano mechanoids. <coughs> but I found the Meccano mechanoid a bit restrictive in terms of what I wanted to be able to do with it. For one thing, I wanted to be um, taller, and I also wanted to be able to get more control over it, what it could do. So I actually took all of the original control parts out of it. So I removed the uh, the motors from uh, it was the servo motors from its shoulders and um, elbow and head and neck and so on. Uh, took out the brain or the mecha brain, as they like to call it, um, and replaced the mecha brain with a Raspberry Pi and put standard radio control servos into the joints. That gave me a lot more control over it. I wrote an app um, so that I could control it from the phone. And um, I got a, put a bit of a speech synthesizer into it um, as well. And um, basically uh, was able to get a lot more um, out of it than I was pre previously able to do when it was just a straightforward mechanoid. But I'd always had this idea that I wanted to turn this thing into um, an entertainment robot, something that could actually sing and dance. Problem is that, um, as with a lot of these humanoid robots, um, even some of the really sophisticated ones, um, they tend to be a bit mechanical in their movements, robotic, if you like. So, um, what I have decided to do now that I've finally got around to um, playing around with this thing again is to find a way of getting it to move in a more human like manner. So, um, if I just call my little presentation here, hopefully whether this will work or not. Uh, can you see my presentation there, Josh? It should say simple motion yeah. camera. You can, okay. Yeah. So uh, the aim then is to make a, an entertainment robot move more naturally. And the way I went about doing that was to, um, first of all, try and decide what would be the best approach to doing it. I could have programmed the motion in, um, but I reckon that that would probably be quite complex, involve a lot of complex maths and would um, be long development time. Even to get to do something as simple as a circle in three dimensions uh, with its hand would be uh, would be quite a bit of uh, work involved. Um, the other option was to perhaps use some kind of computer vision. And in fact, the original mechanoid um, robots had a feature built into them whereby you could use your mobile phone uh, to um, mobile phone camera to actually get the robot to copy your motion. It works a bit, I suppose, like the Kinect, but in a slightly less sophisticated way. Um, but again, I reckon that, that would probably be quite a long uh, amount of time, and I want to get something up and running fairly quickly. So I spent a week or two experimenting with um, a wireless method um, using the BBC Microbit, and I got a few microbits. Um, and using the accelerometer, I um, was able to establish the orientation in my own um, 
arm. So I just stuck a few micro bits on it um, at various points. And then used Bluetooth to communicate with a Raspberry Pi um, and then control the robot. But the problem was that um, it turned out to be quite a slow solution. I'm sure they've always programmed the thing at machine level rather than in a high level language using MicroPython or um, the, um, the the offering from um, from Microsoft um, on the micro bit. Then I would have probably been able to make it faster. But again, I was in a hurry and wanted it to uh, to get a solution fairly quickly. So I decided to go for a wide approach, um, and what that involves basically is this shoulder mounted rig that you can see behind me here um, and um, I'm using potentiometers as angle sensors which I'll talk about a bit more in a minute and then um, an Arduino rather than uh, Raspberry Pi at this stage of the game uh, to actually take the signals from the potentiometers and to drive the servo motors. So I'll give you a quick demo of it so you can see what's going on. Um, so I'll just take that off for a second. Right, okay. Um, okay, so I'll just adjust this so you can see things better. Now, the, at the moment, it, uh, there's two arms on this thing, as you might expect. This is the one that I have modified. Um, so uh, that's the one to keep an eye on. And if I now stand uh, in the rig, attach it to my arm. And then, oh, hang on. Switch the thing on first. Have you not got another one that you prepared earlier? Uh, well, I did prepare it earlier, but I've decided I'd better switch it off in case it went berserk. Because during <laughs> the um, development of this thing, every now and again, it would go crazy and start slapping me. Um, so I thought <laughs> it's probably best. Uh, if I play safe and switch it off in between demonstrations. Right, okay, so strap yourself in. And now you see, as I move my left hand, the robot copies it. And if I move my shoulder out, the robot does the same thing. And if I lift my arm up, the robot will copy me like that. So, I can... so now I've got fairly natural movements in the robot. I can do more sophisticated. Um, motions then i might normally be able to do if i were just programming it um at the moment it just simply copies what i do do but the next stage will be to actually get it to record that using a data logging setup and then it'll be able to autonomously play back the motions that um, i've shown it so let's just go back to where we were Okay, so um, that's, no, it's not. Oh yeah, there we go. So there's my, um, uh, a few pictures of the things that um, go to make this joint up. So those are the potentiometers, basically for anybody that doesn't know what one of those is, it's like a, a volume control perhaps on your um, an old fashioned uh, hi-fi. Um, I've got three of those mounted on the system. So you can see here, there's two mounted into the shoulder joint. I just used some um, waste overflow pipe um, to uh, actually make the joints there. Um, and there's the arm in full. If I just show you the next slide. Um, and those are the, uh, the, the shoulder, that's the original shoulder on the mechanoid. This is the modified version of the shoulder. Um, this was all made of plastic, apart from some of the parts of the motor itself, but um, the new version's got um, aluminium cased motors with aluminium brackets holding it together. Um, these 20 kilogram centimeter servos are about four or five times more powerful than the original ones, um, because that was the, another problem was that the original robot was so weak um, that it could only just about had enough power to lift its own limbs. And um, this is considerably more powerful. Um, I 3D printed a, 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 an adapter so that I could actually mount this lot onto uh, Meccano um, setup, and um, the um, and then use steel connecting rods to hold the whole thing together because, uh, as I say, it is so much more powerful. 
the code uh, was um, pretty straightforward um, because I just simply adapted some code that's already available in one of the Arduino libraries. And this, oops, that particular piece of code is called knob um, because it's designed for people to use uh, if they're using a control knob. Oh, rats. Sorry about this. Um, if you're using a control knob, um, which is what the potentiometer is, then um, it will um, allow you to control that. So, let's see if I can get that working again. Um, so, basically, it just um, reads um, the um, voltage level from the potentiometer pin, feeds it into um, an analog to digital converter in the um, Arduino, and then from that, it can establish the angle. Um, the, Rig is um, pointing at, and then it converts that into a signal for the server motor. Next steps on this will be to introduce some data logging. So I can actually record the um, motions that I've done. My idea will be eventually to build up a library of uh, motions so that um, if I want to teach it dance routines, for example, I can teach it particular. Um, sets of motions which you can then call up at will. Um, I also need to start experimenting with more degrees of freedom. So at the moment, uh, we've got the motion of the elbow, that's one degree of freedom, motion of the shoulder um, back and forth, that's another degree of freedom, and from side to side, that's another degree of freedom. So that's three degrees of freedom. But a typical human arm um, will have six or seven degrees of freedom. So as, as well as being able to um, bend, um, it can also um, rotate your forearm, you can also move your wrist and so on. You can see some examples of that there on that little diagram. So I need to decide um, on how many of those I actually want to introduce because there's a trade-off between how quickly the computer can respond to all the signals from all the joints, because if I've got six or seven on one limb, and they're going to have six or seven on the other limb as well. So I could have up to 14 servos all needing uh, to be controlled simultaneously. Um, and in addition to that, I also want to be able to articulate the waist, so be able to bend in the middle and um, control the head as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get a lot more fluid movement from the whole thing. So watch this space. Um, hopefully by uh, next month, I will have made some progress on this and I'll come back and do a further demonstration. Well, that, that's been amazing. I was going to say, there was a, like, we were just absolutely silent, but then I realised I'd muted everybody's microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Probably just as well. It stops people heckling, doesn't it? <laughs> so it every, every time you bring along just another little, you know, an update to this, it's just amazing, the, the amount of progress. I suppose it's a, it's a good advert for retirement as well. <laughs> Uh, yes, or being locked down under the influence of a virus. Yeah, either of those will do. Yeah, and there's been some really, really interesting uh, suggestions about sending it to go and do your shopping for you so that you don't have to. But we're going to well, save well, them. I'm, I'm, I'm working on that, of course, because there was the other robot I brought into the jam a few months back, which was the bigger, the one with a bigger base on it that I built from a wheelchair base. Okay. Uh, that was and specifically designed for going outside and for possibly doing the shopping. There's, and there's been a, been a few murmurs as well that there's going to be a jam jar session after this evening's jam. So I, I know you don't always join us because you've got that long drive back to that, back that area out in West Lancashire that you have to out travel to. Out in <laughs> Yeah, but you might be able to join the jam jar. Martin's going to give us some details on that later on. Okay. So I'm Nadia from South and Raspberry Jam, and I like coding. And when I'm older, I would like to become a computer scientist. I created next slide, please. So I created the steady hand game. It's all about how steady your hand is. If you touch the metal, it will buzz and put a sad face. In order to start the game, you need to press button A on the micro bit. You have you have to make your way through without touching the metal. Finally, when you finished it. When you press button B to show how many times you have touched the metal, the LED light will turn off and it has been touched. I coded the micro bit in my laptop to buzz, numbers and light. Next slide, please. Andy asked me to speak at, about the steady hand game at South and Raspberry Jam this March and demo it to people and help new people learn code. Next slide, please. 
I I also learned about coding, virtual reality, and cybersecurity with other Essex DMITs. Next slide, please. And then this is a picture of me doing um, cybersecurity and virtual reality. Next slide, please. Next slide. That's it. That's all there is. Okay. Well, that's all for now. Thank you. So I know you you were talking earlier today. We had a dress rehearsal, and you said that you, yeah. you you were hoping that you'd have been able to attend the coolest projects event in Manchester. Oh yeah. So I signed up for the coolest projects in Manchester, but sadly it's been cancelled. But, but we're still getting to find out about yeah your cool project. Yes. Yeah, um, so um the steady hand game every time when you touch the metal it buzz and then it'll tell you how many times you touched it i made it out of a little box of cardboard and i um use my laptop to program the micro bit and now there's there's a lot of cables everywhere that's fantastic and very very clearly spoken as well thank you now my slide this yes i can right okay so uh i'm going to talk about a uh kids coding project that i released recently called simulator virus it's uh in scratch three and uh the history behind this is that uh obviously with the, the pandemic around us uh there was a lot of talk about uh social distancing and how uh, delaying the spread would lower the uh, the peak. Um, and uh, there was a uh, an article in the Washington Post where they ran a lot of simulations that you could play with, and it demonstrated the effect of social distancing and how it, it uh, affected the height of the curve and the and the uh, the length of time that it ran for. Uh, Mitch Resnick uh, seized on that and uh, knocked up some code uh, to share up on uh, uh, Scratch Studio for people to remix. And I thought, well. Wouldn't it be good if, uh, where's that next slide? There we go. Wouldn't it be good if I could actually take that code and turn it into a project that kids could follow step by step um, and actually build the simulation themselves so they understood how it works and maybe they can modify it any way they like afterwards. So in order to do that, uh, I, I first of all had to, to, to take Mitch's code and, and refactor it slightly. Uh, um, I'll talk about how uh, how I did that in a minute, but just to make it clearer so that we could go through this thing in a step-by-step -step fashion. Um, break it down into individual steps so the kids could jump on and off whenever, they, whenever it suits them. They don't have to do the whole thing in one. Uh, and throw some extra challenges at the end for those kids that whiz through and say, what next? Um, I provided this both in HTML form and downloadable PDF. The link uh, will be at the end. Um, Alan, you've have you got my uh, shared um, presentation slides? Alan, um, so not the slides that are you're showing at the moment. No? Okay, I'll 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 throw the the link to that into the chat uh, at the end. So you know there are links here that you could uh, take off it if you wanted to to look further. Um, so I'll move on to the next slide then. Um, yeah. So in terms of refactoring, um, first of all, uh, there were bits of code that uh, did certain things in the simulation, um, such as you know code to to infect that person and update the, uh, the the count of infections in the population, and code that would relate to that person recovering. Uh, I pulled those uh, out code and I, I basically encapsulated them in functions that were named infect and recover so it's much clearer for the kids to uh, to understand what's going on and there was also another aspect to this uh, the particular project the, uh, the concept of people wandering randomly and the term for that is a random walk and I do cover that briefly as a learning point in the lessons to rename his a step to uh, random walk so it kind of fitted better uh, with what what I was uh, explaining um, so the concepts that I introduce in this particular uh, lesson, obviously, you know, let's cover off what social distancing is for the kids, uh, what it actually means, um, and what kind of effect we're expecting it to have. Um, 
what we've got here is a simulation. So I do discuss briefly what a simulation is. I think it's good that the kids can understand that they can they can experiment with ideas in a simulation before going into the real world. And it's, you know, it's a safer environment and you can control certain aspects that you want to experiment with that may not be easy or possible to uh, control in, in, in real life. And obviously, you know, I ask the kids questions, you know, you know why, why would it neither be desirable or possible to actually test these things with a real population and a virus? Um, so we talk about simulations. Uh, I go into random walks to explain this is how we get the population to move. And I talk about state diagrams as well. I've got a picture of that uh, later. It's a very simple thing, but, you know, to get the kids understanding these concepts, because they're all, they're all embedded in this simulation. Um, and oh, actually, I think maybe this is an old uh, presentation. And there's a, uh, uh, yeah, so we go on to drawing a graph of the infections uh, as they occur. And you can see it draw live on the screen and you see the peak, how high it is. Uh, and you can play with a slider for a level of civil obedience. So when the population is, uh, um, you know, ordered to stay at home, there may be a certain percentage that don't listen and that's the idea you know what effects will it have on virus uh, spreading depending how many people actually follow the orders um and i talk about scaling because the graph needs to fit on the screen so you need to kind of map the height of the stage to the size of your population and the width to the number of time steps um so yeah the steps that we go through in the uh, um uh, in this project uh, i start them off by getting Get them to build a static population with clones. Um, I then get them to build in the moving characteristics, which involves the random walk. Um, we then invoke social distancing rules. So if you're forced to stay at home, then you don't move. And uh, if you disobey, then um, you'll be moving about. And we need rules to determine when they obey and when they don't, based on the percentage of the population that, that is obedient. Um, the we then set up the simulation parameters and initialize everything. Uh, so one of the simulation parameters is everyone starts healthy and it takes 100 days uh, for you to recover. You can obviously play with those parameters later if you want. Then we build the infection behavior. So, you know, we build the, the code for infection and build the code for recovery. Um, and we build that into the, the rules of the state machine where you've got three states, you know, healthy, sick and recovered. And there are conditions that uh, will allow you to go from one state to the other, essentially. And I've got a diagram in the uh, in the project that explains that very well. Um, and it's a shame I don't have it because I've just brought up the wrong presentation. Um, we then get them to write the code that plots the curve, which includes the scaling for fitting the screen, um, and get to get them to run the simulation and try it for a number of uh, you know for a number of different levels of civil obedience to see what the effect is. And for those that you know are uh, uh, particularly gung ho, I list a number of challenges uh, at the end for them to try themselves to extend the code. Um, look, text. So that's the uh, that's the link to my website where I published the uh, the project. It's in HTML form and downloadable PDF if you want. And that screen there is uh, an example of uh, the the final output when a simulation is finished. And you can see the slider in the top left and the graph down the bottom. So uh, blue circles are healthy, pink is infected and green is recovered. Um, let me see, I think, yeah, that's pretty much me. But if you give me a moment, if this works, I will, um, I'll pop up here to the scratch uh, tab in my browser and I will actually run Mitch Rennick's code once through, see if it works for you. So we've just i think we've got possibly one or two presentations left now and we're try i'm i'm trying not to run till midnight if possible now i hope so um hi i'm josh again um and something else i do apart from uh, micromag is i develop a program called edubox which is a uh, a drag and drop version of python um for it's very similar to scratch but it's a python based system instead and i was just going to show and share with you a few of the things that i have been doing uh, over the past few months uh, that might be useful and are coming to edgebox very soon so the first one is um a few ui updates so if i this is the current editor by the way here 
uh, on the screen. Um, that's app.edubox.org. And that is, that's been live for um, exactly a year now. Um, so if I show you the new one, so it's received a bit of an update. So you can see there's a nice loading screen there now instead of, uh, it doesn't even show on the new one because um, it's a bit of a quick server that that one's hosted on. Um, but I've just tried to make the elements of the design a bit better. So if we go into Python 3, which is one of the more popular modes, if I just log out, you'll see that there's this new button at the top here, which says log in. Um, and the idea of this is that you can log in with your Google account or Microsoft account or email or Twitter. Um, and what that will do once it has logged in, it's a bit slow with being on um, the call as well. You can see that you've got my name in the top corner here. And what that will allow you to do is it allow you to save Python programs and Edubox programs to your Google account. So if I load up one that I did earlier, so this is a turtle project, you can see that this is something I did earlier today. And I can add something to that. Uh, I can press save and it will save it to my Edubox account. And then if I press run, it will run it like that. So that's another thing. Um, the last feature that I've added so far is, um, to load up a quick sample, it's web USB uh, with a micro bit. So the micro bit allows you to flash files uh, from an online editor in Google Chrome directly to the micro bit instead of dragging and dropping it. And if you press connect now, it will automatically upload the hex file to your micro bit. Um, and it'll show you this cool little loading diagram there. So if I just cancel that. Um, the next thing is I've updated the learning portal with uh, some new resources. It's got a new design as well. Um, and there's some home learning stuff for teachers on there, um, including four home learning turtle lessons um, and these cards and all the different things that you can get there. Uh, and the last thing that Les, who isn't here anymore, I don't think, um, so I've been saving up my Patreon contributions to get a curriculum done. Um, and if I show you one of the first lessons that um, I've been working on with Les, uh, it's going to be an introduction to Python 3 of how to move from scratch to Python. Um, so basically going through from very basic block, um, dragging and dropping, um, show you how Edgebox works and how it translates to scratch. And then um, it has a lesson plan for each one. So all the things that teachers need to give a lesson, an outline of the lesson, that sort of stuff. Um, and then the next one, just to give you a quick turtle example here, is um, some more examples of how to use turtle, how to draw shapes, some code examples. And obviously, you have a lesson plan as well for that. So a few of the patron contribution uh, contributors are in the chat at the minute. Um, and I'd just like to say thank you to them for allowing this to happen, um, because I think this curriculum is going to be really handy for teachers, um, because there'll be lots of content for them to go away with um, and deliver some lessons. So that will be six weeks initially of uh, content. Uh, but I do look to expand that in the future as well. So that's what I've been doing. Um, so I think we're on to the questions for the previous three talks, aren't we? Now? Um, yeah, that's that's right. Um, trying to juggle things here, make get everybody's requests in and played. I still still amazing when I, I bump into people and I talk about edgy blocks and who created it and people cannot believe uh your your age you're because you turned 16 this year isn't that right yeah John, yeah and pe people think it's incredible to think there was some business sort of down in london or something that, that has created it not um not a a young developer like you up here in in preston yeah it's taken i think uh, yeah i've been doing it four years now so it's taken a while but uh, happy where it's got so far. 
and um, and it's I mean you haven't completely worked on it on your own. You've, there's been lots of people in our community in Preston, Blackpool, and, and the, the area around here that have um, mentored yeah. and guided and and given you support with yeah with all of that. Well, the the project like wouldn't happen if it wasn't for people at like Preston and um around the UK and stuff who have supported me with it. Uh, it's not just a one person project at all. Now, so um, there's going to be plenty of content should people wish to go back and watch it. Have you got some? Have you got something, David? You can give us a I've, taste. Of, I've, I've asked got you a you... couple of things actually, because um, yeah. I did offer to to say a little bit about EEG. So, I could, if you let me share a screen, then I can give you, um, I can give you a, a very quick overview of EEG, and then I'll give you a taster of what I'll talk about. A little bit more um, in uh, at the next one because it's still a work in progress. It's been kind of inspired by um, what's been going on. Okay, so let me hit the magic button. Oh, hang on, wrong magic button. <laughs> it's always the fun when you've got um, you've got a couple of screen couple of screens going, and it always goes on to the wrong one. Right. I'm convinced. Okay, so I'm going to share this one with you. Um, do let me know when you can see it. Okay. I can probably see it come back up there anyway in just a moment. So, it's, so we can see an image being shared now? Yeah. Okay, so I was going to say something about EEG or brain waves, and you've probably seen pictures like this. So whilst people were, were, were chatting I was I, I threw a few bits together because I, I work with some I'm at the University of Dundee I, I, I deal with biological data that's my my day job and uh, I work with uh, some really great neuroscientists so we, we play with EEG data um, so this is the kind of thing you're used used to seeing pictures of and how does that go into being able to control something um, so here we've got loads and loads of electrodes on someone's brain we've got each electrode is giving you a different channel. I'm going to flick over to what the mind waves thing is doing. Okay, so if I can, yep. Okay, so we've got a diagram here. And as your brain works, as your neurons fire, they, they're giving off little sort of electrochemical signals. And they're doing that sufficiently that we can detect it. It's really, really weak. It's, it's like a few millivolts, but we can detect that by putting a probe typically on the front of your forehead, just as you saw um, Scott had on that device, another one on the back, and you could use other locations as well, but these two are really good for picking up basic brain waves. And then you need a, a third point, which is not related to the brain at all, so it's not going to change. This is your reference, and typically you'll, yeah, the mind wave thing just clips that on your earlobe, but you can put it on your elbow, on your knee, anywhere else on the body. Um, and the electronics then in the hardware they're measuring the difference between those two points. Now, that could be positive, it could be negative, but it's measuring that very, very small difference and then amplifying that up to give you um, a signal that looks a bit, yeah, just like a sound wave, you know, just jumping up and down as your brain's doing all its different things. And that's loads and loads of different signals all overlaid on top of each other. You're thinking about loads of different things at once and you've got kind of the background processes of your body going on as well. So what we do is you feed that into some hardware that does a mathematical transformation and turns it from amplitude, the size of those um, peaks over time, to the frequency and how strong each particular frequency is there. Because any signal you can make up with a whole load of different frequencies that, you know, different combinations of them put together. And this does maths called the fast Fourier transform and from that, we can then identify the different types of brainwave. Um, so this all happens in hardware in the mindwaves thing. I was, I've been looking at building one of these things for a while, and now this thing's available. You can pick up the, the basic module for $30 or so on uh, AliExpress, get it shipped from China. They do all this in hardware, take those signals, and then we'll convert that to a nice serial output that's, that's really easy, as Scott will... Um, Valor, it's really easy then to read from a Raspberry Pi, just reading a serial signal in. So what does it actually look like? Now, this actually, the, 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 the top line, 
I was scrabbling around to find some sound waves. These are actually uh, bats, but don't worry about that. It, pretend it's brain waves. You know, this is the kind of sound waves or brain waves you'll get in a signal that's just up and down. And we run that fast Fourier transform, and it gives us a spectrogram. So see up the side, we've got different frequencies. I don't know if you can see the cursor move there. Um, but those are going from 0 to 50 hertz. So 50 times a second, things are changing there. And the amplitude uh, goes from dark blue, is very low, up through to really light blue there. And your, your sort of theta and alpha waves are really, really quite, um, quite strong compared to the, the beta, gamma, and delta. So there's a little bit of trying to pull things out. And there's a zoomed-in picture up to the side. Um, there now i have to let on one thing this is not human data this is mouse data my my colleague actually measures brain waves in mice as they're given various sort of experimental drugs or given different tasks and things um but these are the kind of things in human where those frequencies correlate to so these alpha beta gamma delta and theta waves all correspond to different kinds of behavior so these are put together by the mind waves thing into a score for yeah, attentiveness and a score for meditation. And you can just read those directly from the hardware really easily. So it's actually a cool piece of kit. And after seeing Scott's sort of preview um, at lunchtime, I got on to my colleague and said, have you got anything in your your, your sort of public engagement budget? Because can you, can you buy me one of these things? So hopefully in the next week or so, I'm going to have a mind wave to plug in to, and this is where I go on to the, the next um, the teaser. So I'm just going to stop sharing the screen briefly there whilst I switch over to something else. And I will show you if I can persuade the buttons to work correctly. A very, very quick teaser. Um, for this, right, let's go back to sharing. And we will share this. So I'm in Dundee, Dundee Makerspace, which has the same initials as me, which is great. There's my Twitter handle if you've got, if you want to follow me for all sorts of nonsense and other things. Anyway, um, I'm of a certain era. And when I grew up, um, one of the toys when I was sort of sub teen, um, that you could play with was this thing, an Etch-a-Sketch, which was fantastic because you could just twiddle the knobs and draw pictures. Um, but one of the things that was also around in the, the 1980s were, were, were these things here, these pen plotters. And um, put that together with one of these, little my Raspberry Pi Model B, and you can turn that into a nice technical Etch-a-Sketch. Um, and what would be really, really cool with that now is using the EEG things, now that I've seen how Scott does it, and hopefully I'll have a toy to play with, is actually being able to draw pictures with your brain. And I'll show you all about how to do that at the next talk. So is that enough of a teaser? That's, that's brilliant, David. Um, we sh I think we, we've probably got enough people from Dundee that we could, we could run and jam, especially just <laughs> listen to all the fantastic stuff that's going on in Dundee and at the Makerspace. Um, right, I, I'm wondering, 